it muted until we do call on you. And then please, uh, I ask that you re be respectful, that you state your name and that you let me know where you live so I, we can get an idea of if you have a problem area where that is so we can start tracking it and following up with you. Um, so again, uh, this is an opportunity for you to just let me have it or be polite and however you want to do it. Uh, but it's our opportunity to just have a conversation because we don't get to do this in person. Unfortunately, this is the best we, we can do. We're now having office hours every two weeks on, on Friday from uh, 9 to 10. So you can put this in your calendar. Uh, of course, we won't, we'll be taking off the holidays and won't be doing that during uh, the Christmas break. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Michael because he has some instructions for you on how to raise your hand and how to get our attention. Michael? Thanks, Pam. Yeah, so for computer users during the meeting, you can click on the icon labeled participants at the bottom center of your PC or Mac screen. And then at the bottom of the window on the right side of that screen, you can click on the button labeled raise your hand so that your digital hand is raised. And then if you're calling on the phone, uh, you can dial star nine to raise your hand and then we'll note it from there. If you're unfamiliar with this process and you have no idea what I'm saying right now, you can also just raise your hand like this and I can write down your name and we can call on you uh, that way as well. Uh, just a heads up, we are recording this meeting so that we can follow up on any outstanding items and so that we can post it on YouTube so that it can be t transcribed uh, for folks that are hard of hearing at a later time. And with that, I'll hand it back to Pam. Great, thank you, Michael. So there, there is no long speech. I've already given my introduction. I do wanna give you two dates that are really important. Is Martha O'Connell on here? Yes, she is. So you'll be happy to know, Martha, that we are, we follow through on our commitment. Our next town hall is December 2nd. We're going to have hip, hip, Kip Harkness, who is deputy director of the city of San Jose. And he will be speaking about emergency preparedness. That's it from 6.30 to 7.30 in the evening. And it won't be the a format like this. It'll be more of a presentation with questions asked late and answered later on. But that is December 2nd. And then our next town hall meeting is two weeks from today, which is December 4th. So you have us twice that week. Did I get that right? Okay, with that, let's start with any questions. Who, who would like to start? I would, of course. Tessa would, Nancy. Tessa, if you could raise your hand so that we can identify you. We want to do this in an orderly okay. fashion. All right. And, and we're going to call I'll, on him. Oh, I'll, so, I'll raise my hand, sorry. Okay, I thank remember. you. So, so what we're going to do also, um, just so everybody gets a chance. Um, I'm not timing any conversation, so I'm not timing you for two minutes, but please try to be, uh, everyone, if you could be succinct, so we can get on with as many questions as possible. All right, uh, let's start with the first one, which is the phone number 5140. Michael, welcome. You need to unmute yourself, sir. There you go. Oh, hi. Hello, hello. Yeah, uh, you know, I want to know what's going to happen in the future. With a, someone keeps beeping me here. Hello. It's kind of a weird clicking coming from your phone. It's not my phone. Someone, it's coming from someplace else. This Zoom thing, by the way, Pam, I've told you before, and 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 Scott, you guys got you this. Seem to hear Michael, okay, I don't Michael. want to go there. I, I, I want this to be okay. a constructive conversation. Okay, all right, so all right. I okay, well, I, I've told you this before, but I'm going to tell you something else besides how horrible Zoom is, okay? Where is all the money going to come from for all these new traffic pops that they want? You know, uh, Washburn gave me a long-winded uh, three-page essay about, you know, where the money comes from and doesn't. But how on earth is it all of a sudden so important to double or triple the traffic cops in this town? Don't tell me about Vision Zero. 
I want to know where the money came from. She couldn't tell me where the money came from because she claims she doesn't know where it comes from. But I think you do, Pam, because you guys approve these budgets and we do not need more traffic cops. I'm sorry. We have cars being stolen, homes being broken into all of a sudden. Not only that, how are they going to give tickets when the traffic court is closed? Are you aware of that, Pam? Is the county aware of that? Because you're not going to be able to revenue the people like you want to, right? Oh, oh, wait, like, oh, wait, the traffic court, the traffic court's open. The traffic court is open for you to pay online, okay? So I want to, I want to know one thing. Where do you guys get off hiring more people to get to, to revenue the tax, hardworking, taxpaying citizens in your district? Michael, I'd like, like to crap, answer your question. Way. Michael, I'd like to answer your questions and get to as many as possible. So you asked where the money comes from. Funding the police department comes from the general fund. So it comes from all of our revenue sources, which are dramatically down. We did increase funding to the police department in certain areas. The traffic enforcement was not one of the areas that we increased enforcement to. We increased enforcement in the, uh, the downtown patrol uh, officers walking beats and uh, other areas. But the, all of the funds that uh, fund the police department are made public through the budget process and we approved that in July. Uh, with regards to the traffic court, I was aware that it was closed. Uh, I don't have any control over that. That's run by the county. Um, and I, I forgot what your other issue is, but I understand your concerns about the traffic cops. And we are in the middle of reimagining. This is, Michael, this is not a conversation, a debate that we're going to have back and forth, because I know how you feel about the police department, and I know how frustrated you are in the traffic enforcement unit, but we are not expanding the traffic enforcement unit. The money, the budget is given to the police chief, and the police chief determines how he's going to deploy those resources. We are the most uh, we are the smallest funded police department in the in the man man and women that we have out there uh, serving and protecting us. So the additional funds uh, that we raised were really to offset any major retirements we have and and other sources. So with that, I'm going to go to the next question. Which glorify is, welfare. Glorify welfare for them. Tessa, you need to unmute yourself. All right, just want to thank you, Pam Foley, uh, you know, for doing these um, group uh, talks. Really, really appreciate it. It's the right way. You're doing a great job, Pam. Thank you so much. And I love that you know we can see each other, and that I love that you're going to do it every two weeks. We have a scheduled time to talk to you. That's really beautiful. So thank you. I'm very thankful for that. Tessa, and, I appreciate that. And I haven't seen you in so long. I almost forgot what you look like. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Yes. I, 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 you Your know, hair's I, back. So I don't, I know, I'm not seeing you braid it back like that. Okay. What'd you say? Well, I'm sorry. What was the last I'm not used said? to seeing it pulled back like that. It's funny. Okay, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Very funny. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for yeah. telling me. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. And okay. yeah, thank you. And I guess I was uh, telling my husband this morning as we were listening to the leaf blower, and I was remembering that my husband's from Chico, California, and we'd go up there to visit his parents, and you'd have quiet. And one of our nature deficit disorders is noise, you know? And I love that you talked about noise because noise is a stepchild of pollution that nobody thinks it's like your personal problem, you know, that you don't like noise, you know? And we need to ban leaf blowers, uh, Pam. And so, so I, th I think there's probably someone on this call who had that specific question for me. So I'll get to that in a minute, but I will okay. talk to you about noise. I am a nutcase about noise. Ask I love people. you. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, so leaf am I. So am I. Wednesday evening afternoon, I've got leaf blowers going for like five hours, but that's not, right. I'm, I'm just a nutcase about noise. It's just the way I, I, I am. It. I, I love it. I, you know. And it's funny. I will, yeah. I'm one of these people who sits down and watches TV and I can fall asleep in like five minutes watching TV, but turn on <laughs> it. Once I wake up, whatever volume the noise is, it's like, that's too loud. So I, I get the noise pollution. I definitely relate to that. Right. Um, okay. You. Thank I, you. And um, oh, can I just say one thing? Cause it's really important. 
um, to my husband, um, uh, we are building, uh, a, we are planning on building, taking our one one and turning it into a six six as we address housing, our housing crisis. And one thing I wanted to talk about was the way the ADU is given a priority in regards to, you know, I don't know how we get give priority, but I feel that what we're doing and taking our one one and turning it into a six six, but what we're doing too, Pam, is all of the units will be isolated where everyone will have their own kitchen, their own bathroom and their own laundry facility. And so this is what we're mo moving towards in, in addressing COVID-19 issues and also climate issues in regards living, we live very much near, you know, the, the, the Google village. And so we are building housing um, to, you know, in our, in our core as we need to live in a walkable neighborhoods, which we live in. So I just wanted to pass that by you as we, you know, are, we're, we're trying to build this six, six and needing support from our city to do so. Um, so that, that was something, anything you can do to understanding the real estate issues, as well as specifically the ADU benefits and transferring those. And I've, I've tried to talk that to Mayor Licardo about that because we've been planning this for a while, how, you know, take, you know, uh, in intensifying the housing opportunities is what the ADU is about. And then also the issue of, um, you know, taking an R1, well, we're an R8, but we're in a residential, we're in the Garden Alameda, you know, how we can move that opportunity housing towards, you know, you know, having each of us as individual re uh, homeowners right. taking Thank our you. homes. Thank you, know, you so Jess, I appreciate that. And I know there's a contractor on here who I'm gonna get to next. Uh, that might be able to help you with that, but you do need, to, uh, because you're single family zoning, you can add an ADU, but you cannot add the other units without a, without a zoning change. So uh, they're not there. We haven't approved the opportunity zoning and that's not gonna come to us for uh, well, quite some time. But well, we're doing it, just so you know, Pam, we're doing it within our original footprint. We're not changing the footprint. It's just like tiny little rooms that are, oh, are isolated. Okay. What? It's within your house. Yes, okay. it's within the house. Okay. Um, next, I'm gonna talk to Todd Gedrin. Todd, how are you? I haven't seen you in since Willow Glen High School days when our kids were there. Doing well, there. thanks, appreciate it. <laughs> so I just have a, a simple question and appreciate the time. So I'm wondering how many county, city, state employees during this COVID time have either lost their jobs or had their pay reduced, et cetera, et cetera. Like how many during the whole time, how many librarians as an example, lost their job when they were, when the, everything was shut down? Ooh, that's a good question. And I don't know that I have those details in front of me. I may have to get back to you on the specifics of that. We did not lay off any permanent employees as a result of COVID, they were working at home and actually deployed to do other things. So if they were uh, a librarian or working in the library or other parts of the city of San Jose, it's not like they were just sitting at home eating bonbons. They were doing work for the emergency office, helping with deploying, uh, helping our community deal with COVID. And, and uh, in the beginning when COVID occurred or when we were in shelter in place, <laughs> when COVID occurred, it's been it's still going on, not over. Um, but when we went into shelter in place, we moved into emergency uh, orders within the city and that has a whole deployment of staff. So the majority of our staff was deployed doing emergency work. Our number one work job was an agreement with the county to distribute food. So we now have distributed up to, I think it's 8 million food uh, meals around Santa Clara County, but it's it was our responsible to distribute that and provide PPE and other things for our community. So it, it, it's not as if they were, they weren't laid off. Who we did uh, lay off or did not extend their contracts were any temporary employees that we had. So at the end of July, we did not renew those contracts, but if we go back to full 
uh, service next year or when we look at the budget next year, we may be bring them back. We may have, they have an opportunity to come back. Does that answer your question, Todd? Yeah, if you could get back to me though, um, I have a real issue that essentially very few to no, no government employees have any issues where the rest of us, like we've been devastated by this thing. Um, and, and so I'm having a real problem where your average folks can't do it. We can't even make money. We're not allowed to basically. And anyone who's either elite, high tech or government has had no issues with this. So if you could let me know if there were any people or whatnot, or just what the stats are, that would be awesome. Yeah, I, I appreciate your thoughts. And, and um, I know that our small businesses have been really affected by COVID. And you know, the, a lot of people feel that the city has something to do with that. We really don't. We follow the rules of the county. And with every shutdown, it's like a knife in my heart because I know small business owners. I'm a small business owner myself. And I know how hard this business is, this, this environment is for people who have restaurants. Those in, in the construction trades, construction trades were shut down in the first couple of months unless you were building affordable housing, which made absolutely no sense to me. So I wrote a letter to the county to open up construction. There are other areas that I've written letters to the county to encourage them to open up. And we've opened up a little bit, but now that we're back in purple, which is really scary and, and um, makes me really anxious as someone who's 61 and not quite in the high risk. Well, I am 60 and above high risk area, but you know, you just worry about all the people around us who are getting sick and dying from COVID, but also there's the tremendous economic impact. And I definitely acknowledge that I'm a, every Friday, every Saturday, um, we do have some resources for small businesses. There was PPP funding from this, this, federal government. Hopefully the federal government will maybe come out with something else that might help our renters. You know, there's lots of areas where people are suffering economically and not just physically. So we need to take care of all of that. The physical and, and financial health of our city is very serious and I take it very serious. As I said, as a small business owner, I know what it was like to go through the last uh, shut down or last shut down last crisis we had in 2008 what that did to my business and and others it's just devastating so i know what people are going through and you know when people aren't working it's not just the money it's the mental health that affects them more so uh or as much as the money because they're not able con to contribute to their home than the, the and their family and then with covid there's people who are home who are working full time, but they're also taking care of their kids' education. So it's, it is not an easy situation. We need to, the, the good news with Pfizer and Moderna is about the vaccine and getting that deployed as quickly as possible will be fabulous, but it's not gonna come quick enough and it's not gonna come probably to, uh, it, it should rightly go to those who are highest risk to those essential workers, hospital workers, et cetera, who we need to be healthy to take care of us. But it's, I hear you, Todd, and we'll, we'll try to get some numbers, but uh, many of those people are still working with the city, um, the city, and I hear, I hear you. Okay, moving on to, uh, I have someone who's called call-in user number one. Who might that be? Oh, that's Kath. Okay. Who is that? Oh, caller user number one. This is me, Marcel O'Connell. Uh, Pam, I've already written you a letter on this, but I want to get the word out into the community for the folks that are on this call. Activists like Tessa. Uh, Tessa, the seniors and the disabled have a real issue. Uh, I have a security system because I am a disabled senior and I live alone, and I have a security system. And I got a bill from the uh, police department for, and I'm struggling to find exactly how much it was. Oh, it was a warning. It was a warning that said uh, if, I, if I had um, 
another false alarm. I was going to have to pay two hundred and fifty dollars. This is beyond the ability of most seniors to pay. And then the next one, it goes up to three fifty. The next one is five hundred, and the next one is seven hundred and fifty dollars. Now, here's the problem with this: there was no alarm at my house. There was no alarm. The police department, and I'm not bashing the police, got the forms wrong. I confirmed this with the police department, and I confirmed this with my vendor. And I asked the very nice lady in the police department to send me a bill that said, we're waiving this charge. It's our error. She said they don't do that. Repeat, they do not do that. I'm telling you that I have four college degrees. I have the ability to rebut this charge. English is my first language. Why do I say that? Because lots of people are going to get this form and they are going to panic. They are not going to know what to do and they're going to cancel their security system. This is a huge issue. The police department needs to send letters out explaining this was a wrong charge. So, Pam, as you are aware, I sent an email uh, to, uh, on November 9th to the acting police chief, the director of finance, the city manager, all of these folks, you were included, and I have received no response. I understand we're in the midst of COVID. I understand that, that responses are going to take a little longer, but this is a huge issue. Seniors and the disabled and indeed women who live alone, we need this protection and we don't need to get these notices and be frightened and think we're going to have to cancel our service because we're going to get these bills. So please, Pam, uh, put a fire under these people, tell them they have got to respond and they've got to implement a system whereby the person that gets the bill is told, sorry, it's an error. So thanks for listening, and community activists on the line, get this issue out into the community and help the seniors and the disabled. So thank you. Martha, can you possibly send us a copy of that letter so we know what we're looking at and working I on? did. I sent it to you on the 9th of November. Did you include my staff? <laughs> hey, hey, I sent it to that? you. No, I did see your letter. I mean, I saw your comments and, and I actually, uh, because it's uh, PD and others were taking, should be the front line of taking it. I was hoping that you would hear back from them, but we'll follow up with you on that. You should be They're doing absolutely nothing. Okay, we'll follow up. All right, thank you. Thank November 9th, I can, that helps me check. Thanks. Okay. Next caller, uh, next caller, next participant is Brad Imamura. Hey, good morning, Council Member Foley. And again, I just wanna echo uh, Tessa's uh, comments. I think you're one of the most accessible council members and I appreciate that. And I'm not just saying it because I'm talking to you right now because I know you you and your staff are doing a great job. But anyway, real quick, with regard to Governor Newsom's recent uh, declaration of a curfew, and um, I know it's, it's really serious and I strongly uh, support wearing masks. And I see Greg is wearing his mask inside the house. So I just wanna say, <laughs> I, I think that's a little overboard, but anyway, Regardless, I just want to know how serious the uh, San Jose PD will be in terms of enforcing this curfew, or is that something that's just going to be a, you know, a, a voluntary thing for, for people? Brad, really good question, and I don't know the answer for that. I just heard about it yesterday, just like all of us, and I haven't had a conversation with the police department as to how they're going to enforce it. it, it the, these are very difficult, these things are difficult for them to enforce. So if you have noisy neighbors who are next to you and, and they're having a party after 10, you should, if you're concerned, let the police department know about it. And then they'll, they'll go out as, and check on it as they can. But I don't know, I haven't heard. It is uh, the executive order from the governor. So, it has to be enforced, but they're not going, you know, we have such a small force, they're not gonna be driving around the whole city of San Jose to see who's violating it. But I sure hope people take it seriously because, you know, uh, 
it, I can't emphasize enough how, and I know you all know this, COVID is really serious. We have over 250,000 deaths in the country. That's ridiculous. Um, we don't, we need vaccines, but we need also people to wear masks and, and there are people with high risk and we need to protect them. Our Thanksgiving plans have all changed. I shoot, I have a daughter, she doesn't live with me and I don't get to spend Thanksgiving with my daughter. Uh, she's gonna come by, we're gonna sit outside. Hopefully it will be sunny. We'll socially distance, but we are not gonna have a typical Thanksgiving meal, but I am giving thanks for what I have and what I can do. And uh, we should all count our blessings, uh, what we have. But I, I don't know what the police department is going to do. I know they will not be proactively going out and um, ticketing people because they just don't have the resources. But if you are in an area that you have noisy neighbors, you know, you're at an Airbnb and it's a party house, you should let the police know. Does that help, Brad? Not, it's not, you know, I, I wish we had more police that we could, could do that, but we don't. No, it is reassuring and we understand, but if I can just real quick uh, piggyback on what Todd had commented on, I have a, also a concern about with the COVID with, with staff uh, responding. Uh, I, I hate to think that this is now an excuse for staff to, to, to not uh, return phone calls, respond to, to emails. And I've seen a dramatic, dramatic loss in, in, in terms of customer service. And I hope you kind of look into this. I know we all have to, you know, readjust our work schedules and, and, our, and our lifestyles, but, but this to me is just no excuse with the technology we have for, for people not to get back in touch with people, you know, at, at the minimum within 48 hours, I would think. So thank you. Brad, I couldn't agree with you more. I think we have, uh, we've been in COVID uh, crisis for a long time at city staff. And now the last few months, we're finally uh, getting back to, I wouldn't say normal, but we're getting back into emphasizing trash pickup, uh, uh, safety at our uh, homeless encampments, uh, large trash pick, uh, uh, um, vehicle abatements and things like that, where we weren't doing that for a long time, but we are starting to get back to that. And yeah, staff is slow to respond. And it is frustrating on our side too, because you contact us, we contact staff. Sometimes we get really quick responses and other times we don't. So it's frustrating for us because we wanna give you a quick response, but response, but if we're not getting it from our staff, we can't. I know they're working hard and they're, uh, jumbling a lot, but so are we. So we all, as you said, we're all having to adapt to COVID and working from homes and being more efficient and effective. And I know that the city manager is uh, really dedicated to that and his team is dedicated to that, but it's my job to continue to advocate for our residents and making sure that the work is getting done quickly and that you're getting the response you get quickly. But I know there are departments like the planning department that is understaffed and they're not doing inspections. I know code enforcement wasn't going out for a long, long time. They're starting to go out now. So they have a backlog. You know, we have a lot of things like that and it's frustrating for us too, because we can't, we have checklists of resident areas that are concerns and we can't move that item off our checklist until uh, other staff members uh, take care of it. So I hear you. I hear you. Thank you, Council Member Foley. I have to wear a mask and... in my own home now when my care wife's caretakers are here. I know, Greg. Greg has a, a wife at high risk. Say hi. Hi. Hi, Sue. Um, Thank you for coming. Greg's a Milpitas, Greg and Sue are Milpitas residents who are paying attention to what's going on in San Jose. Okay, going on, next person is Brian Wheatley. Brian, you've got a ton of stuff going on. Thank you for your work at San Jose Unified. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for the shout out. I had to come on on my phone with just my picture because I had to shave. I can't talk to my council member so, I had to say I, so that's why I was not live for the first portion. Um, that's funny. 
I, I appreciate all the work that you're doing. I know we had our board meeting last night and you know it was heartbreaking because we were moving forward with a, a reopening uh, in January. And of course the jump from orange right over red to purple, you know, we're continuing to plan, but obviously we had to um, put the brakes on to a certain extent. And, you know, I know how many families are struggling with distance learning as a, you know, a long time now retired teacher. This is, you know, this, this two dimensional interaction is not what we want because it's not as relational as we want to be. So I guess my question, that was a long sort of introduction is, just any ways that we can, as the school district, can partner with the city just to, to help everyone understand how serious this is. I mean, I loved your comment about your daughter. My mom is in Aptos and we're not going over the mountain to see her. I would love to, but she's 87 and I'm at higher risk because of my cerebral palsy. So, but again, it just, you know, but we have to do what's best for the community. So just, you know, any suggestions either now or in the future for ways that we can partner um, because together we will get through this, but, but it just be right now going into the holidays, that pull to want to go see family is just so strong. So. Yeah, and we know the spike uh, that is resulting in the numbers today are from Halloween. So if we fast forward to next week and Thanksgiving, we're gonna see another spike because people will gather at their families. We have a family that we go to regularly and we're not, go and it's a small group, there's only five of us, but uh, because we really can't go outside because it's cold, we're just probably not going to do anything. And it's very, it's very difficult. So, but this is, you know what, this is one year, this is one holiday in our lives and we can make one modification for this holiday and probably Christmas too, to get through it together and get through it healthy. The economic impact is harder to solve because we don't have the immediate power over that, but we all have the direct power over our own health. And it's not just our health, it's the health of those people that we come in contact with. So that's it's, it's really important that we wear masks and I had a, someone come bang on my door the other day, no mask. And I was shocked that this person was coming to my door with no mask on. And you know what, I know people are object to wearing masks. I understand that, but now is the time to step up. Now is the time for everybody to wear masks because some of us like Martha and, and Greg and his wife and others, they're high risk. And we cannot afford, it's, we cannot put them at risk because we're not watching out for them. So, you know, I, I know that's kind of a bully pulpit and I'm lecturing a little bit uh, and, but that's uh, part of my role as a city council person. I feel for your students, Brian. I know um, I have a lot of uh, friends who still have kids in school and, I hear, and a lot of my residents reach out to me and talk about their kids and how they're struggling and how distance learning isn't good for them. They need in-person uh, learning. That's where they learn best. Me too, that's how I learn best is by uh, being in a classroom and hearing the lecture in person. I'm tired of Zoom meetings and I can't imagine how our kids are. Our teachers are now not just our educators are not just teachers, there are parents too. And the parents are busy working and taking care of a hundred other things. So we, we need to get back in the classroom, but not yet, not yet. It's not, it's not safe. So, because we know the it's not the little kids who are transmitting it. It's the 18 to 34 year olds who aren't feeling any, um, any side effects of possibly COVID, but they may be around people who have it, and then there it's just a, a, a chain. So, uh, I, I'm I'm sorry to go on and on about that, but it's frustrating that here we are, what eight and a half months in, nine months in, I've lost track, and still I'm working at my home. And and the other and so there's the health, there's the mental health, there's the physical health, and then there's the financial health that we all need to address. So. Uh, we can work together. We've worked on digital inclusion and connectivity with the schools, uh, but that doesn't really solve what you're talking about. So 
we need to continue to support them. I do want to give a, an acknowledgement of Karen Adamski, who is here too. She was one of my first District 9 star recipients last year. And she did, she was nominated by someone in her neighbor. A District 9 uh, star is someone who is an unsung hero in the community doing good work to make their lives of their neighbors a little bit better. And we learned so, uh, there she's got her certificate. And we, we learned so much about Karen and the positive messaging that she does around her neighborhood. And I've driven by your neighborhood even today, Karen, and I see your image, I know what you're doing out there. She leaves all these signs around her neighborhood, uh, positive uh, imaging of things that you know, just to take care of your neighbors, be kind to your neighbors, uh, be thoughtful about your neighbors. And I know we all have that in us. I know it's hard to still think about that because some of us are a little grumpy and I get grumpy too. Uh, so we have to kind of take ourselves away from the grumpiness and try to remember to go with kindness and go with gratitude as much as we possibly can. Okay, um, Chris Roth, what say you? Hi, good morning, council member, and hi, Michael and Scott, everyone. Chris Roth here, former president of the Willow Glen Neighborhood Association. Um, had a question for you relating to Fire Station 37, uh, currently under construction near Kirtner and Lincoln Avenue, and a station that I know will significantly increase response times for large swaths of the district. Just wanted to ask you if you knew like a status of when that construction, what kind of timeline that construction might be completed in the, in the future. Uh, I think it's the end of 2022 is when the fire station is set to be completed. Does any, I know it's 2022. I don't know if it's mid 2022 or what, but we're on track. We broke ground uh, just a couple of months ago. And I'm really excited about that because that will, that uh, for those of you who don't know, that will service the Northern part of district nine and the Southern part of district six. It's near the Willow Senior Center on Lincoln Avenue and Kirtner. So um, I live in the Northern part of, or the Southern part of Willow Glen. So it, what it will do currently when there is a fire or an emergency, the fire engines are pulled from the Pearl Station or from Ross Station in District 9. And that those are distances away. So this will enable that part of Willow Glen to have faster service, but it'll also speed up the service in other parts of the city as, uh, as the need won't occur from the fire engines being pulled from those two fire stations. So good questions. I was really, I. I, and, and I want to thank you all for approving Measure T, the Measure T tax, because without Measure T, which was approved in 2018, this would not be funded. And it's been a priority for Willow Glen for a long time. Uh, and, but getting it finally breaking ground, I think it's been on the war on, in the in the thought process for at least 20 years. So finally having it come to fruition is wonderful, but I think it's 2022. Thanks, council member. Nice to Thanks see you. Thanks for asking. Okay, next is Phil Poppenfuss. Did I butcher your last name? Phil? That, that, um, that wasn't too bad. Don't worry about that. But I um, wanted to thank you for um, having the call on November 5th for Cameron Park Plaza. I learned a lot, it was very informative. And um, I wanted to um, voice my, um, my preference that the, um, the building heights be limited for um, this project. I, I understand you know, that there's the plan now is for six story buildings, the, the maximum um, height um, for the project, but I'd like to see that limited to four story buildings um, maximum. I think there's a lot of other people who have the same preference. And um, my request is that you listen to um, the neighbors and the residents and, and what they want. And I think that you'll find that a lot of them have the same preference that I do. I think it's going to be an excellent um, project. And I think that the, um, the residents will benefit. But I think that we have to listen to what, um, what the people in the neighborhood want and so I just wanted to let you know my opinion. 
I appreciate that, Phil. There will be a lot of uh, community meetings, individual or group meetings from here on out. The, the This is a, a, a project that will benefit the community greatly. The height in part is based on the requirements of the city and the signature project status of this development. So in order to, so you know they put everything, all the parking underground, we push them to create more parking underground and to create an environment at the Cambrian Park Plaza that was walkable, family friendly, uh, so you can sit outside, have a cup of coffee, watch your kids play in all of the, in the seven acres of open space. But the trade-off to do that was that they put all of their parking underground. That meant that they had to get height somewhere. And so they put the height on the main building, which is the one that hugs Union and uh, Camden. And it's five stories of residential apartments and one story of commercial. I hear you, that has been one of probably the number one concern of residents. Um, and we'll see how that goes forward. I, I don't know that anything will happen there because if they, it, it, Phil, here's the trade-off. If they lower the height there, they have to create height somewhere else because they're required to have a certain amount of housing units. That's required under the signature project application that they have submitted. There are a lot of details about it, but please continue to weigh in. Uh, we've took our survey and there are just, there really, there's a few areas that the neighbors are and the residents are concerned. That is one of them, um, but there are trade-offs and I, I hear you about the height. That would, will be, if it, if it gets approved, it will be the highest building in Camden, uh, in Cambrian, um, and the most dense. But it, so, you know, going forward, I don't know that the builder will come back with any modifications to that or not. Uh, currently, that's what it is. And the one reason they have to do that is because the single family residences that are at the back of the project. Uh, and, the, and I know for some of you, you're not in Cambrian or not maybe paying that close attention. So I'll, I won't spend too much time on it, but there's single family residential units back there that originally the developer had higher density there and they took that away to create a better transition and buffer from the neighborhood. So the neighbors didn't have to look at a big wall of apartment buildings. So that's the trade-off. They had to get it somewhere and putting it on that commercial, uh, that area where there isn't a lot of housing and is is a better location. Is it perfect? No. Um, is it that it's better than having it right next to the neighborhood? But let me ask one minor point. I, I don't want to take too much time, but are you saying that the the number of housing units in the plan is the minimum that they can have based on this signature status? It sounded like you were kind of um, saying that. I believe that's the case. It's okay. actually below the minimum. Yeah, it's they're actually required to have 55 housing units per acre. This proposal is less than that. And uh, planning hasn't approved it. It's a long way from coming through to planning. It, it I mean, uh, being a approved by the planning commission. It won't come through until, is it December, 2021? I it'll, think it's it'll be a while, yeah, yeah, around there. We actually just got the timeline today, so it'll yeah. be about and a year and a half. Yeah, okay. So at any rate, Phil, uh, it is the, that is one of the issues that the residents have been concerned about and it's on our list of things that we talk about with the developer on a regular basis. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Next, uh, I see that Marty has a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Yes, uh, I'm following up on the gas leaf blower question. We'd really like to see a ban on gas leaf blowers in San Jose. I hear you, me too. Uh, I, I'd love, uh, it was going through uh, and we need to check on the status. That's one of those things. So, so we passed things in priority setting session in February or March. And uh, then the council or the staff is given direction to work on these things. That's one of the things that's been 
delayed as a result of COVID. So I need to check back on it. The idea, initially it came through and it wasn't, it didn't go forward because of the concern about small businesses who aren't, you know, uh, our, our gardeners, they're small businesses and requiring them to change to electric leaf blowers or uh, brooms would uh, dramatically affect their business. So we have to look at how we can transition into that. But I, uh, I don't like the electric or the gas powered leaf blowers either. It's one of those noise things that Tessa brought up that it just- yep. Plus they're highly air polluting. I know. The two know. cycle motors are extremely air polluting. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, I know, I know they are. And uh, since we're all working at home, we notice them a lot more than we did when we weren't working at home. I mean, they're out there regular. I'm surprised I don't hear one right now. Uh, right, you hear them my every day. Friday afternoon, he'll be here, you know, in a couple of hours and I'll have to go into another part of the house to avoid it or put on my earplugs. But right, it's not just a seasonal thing. Marty, I do want to work on it and we'll find out where we are on that. But but it has to be these are small businesses. I don't want to damage their ability to do their work. I want to be able to help them. So we right. have to figure that out. Right. I understand. They're just trying to make a living. Right. And that's a tool that, you know, came into our society with no approval, you know, decades ago. And we've, we've outlawed two cycle motorcycles. We've outlawed two cycle motor scooters. If, if you go online and check out two cycle motor pollution, this is one of the biggest sources of air pollution in third world countries, you know, and we're still using them here in the United States. But over 24 cities in California have already banned these things including some big cities like Los Angeles, Santa Barbara. So I think it's high time that, you know, San Jose gets on board with this. I appreciate that. And we have a petition online. If anyone's interested, go to moveon.org and look up Ban Leaf Blower San Jose. Thank you. Over, over 1,400 people have signed this already. But I, I appreciate your help. And I hope the rest of the council can get on board. I know there are a few, I think I am in, you can, I'm only limited on how many council members I can talk to. I could talk to up to four others. And I think I'm in a Brown Act, it's called with council member Davis, I think. But right, but yeah, Deb Davis. Staff is, staff is sh Michael's shaking his head yes. So, uh, and I know Johnny Camus was big on that too, but he's uh, turned out, so. Right. Uh, we just need to pursue it. It's one of those and, things that's fallen aside in COVID, but, and, and we just need to pursue it. Right. And the other thing with wanna, the electric. Yeah, but with the electric, I don't want to yeah. harm small businesses. I want to be able to help them, but also it's noise pollution and it's air pollution. And I, I agree with you. Right. One more thing I'd like to say is the electric blowers, you know, they're not buying gas and oil anymore. So they do have to buy batteries, the rechargeable batteries, but in the long term, they're saving all that money in gas and oil. They're they're no longer purchasing. Yeah. So we got to get them to convert. Yeah. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next is Sue Grasshoff. There we are, unmuted. You're welcome. This might fall under uh, what some of the other conversation has been about uh, some services being slowed down by COVID. We have a street light out and due to things that are going on in our neighborhood, I think it's very important that we get the street light back. And we reported it about- About four weeks ago. I think I called it in about the middle of November, uh, October, pardon me. And I called it in once again because there was no action and there still hasn't been action. So it's been four weeks, a little four weeks plus, and the street light is still out. There is no indication that anything is being done. And as Sue said, we are in a neighborhood where we have seen some recent problems, break-ins and thefts and various other things. And a street light, an operating street light, is really something that we need. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, not there. Can you uh, give us the information, the exact location and the poll number, and then we can follow up with you on that? Yes, we certainly can do that. 
Yep. Scott, shall we email you that information? Oh, wasn't I'm muting there. Yeah, actually, that'd be fantastic. If you could just okay. uh, send us an email with either the address where the uh, poll is located or if we have can, both. Yeah. If you have the uh, poll number, that would be fantastic. Uh, we did uh, just uh, have a conversation with them uh, the other day about another street light. Uh, some of the slowdown is uh, due to when a street light is going out now, they're replacing them with the new LED street lights. Uh, they do not have any more of the, the yellowish tint uh, lights in stock. And so you have a hardware uh, conversion that needs to take place uh, so that it accepts the uh, LED street light. These uh, LED street lights are not only brighter, but they're also smart uh, lights so that they're motion sensitive. And then also emergency vehicles can turn them on uh, when, uh, when they move through the area. Great, we'll send you the information. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, thanks. We're now at 9.52. We just have eight minutes more. I have a question from Todd Young. Hi, Hi Todd. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I just uh, wanted to raise the issue with um, uh, the tennis courts over at Door Park. Um, the last couple of months, tennis has become very popular with the COVID restrictions. and. Uh, in particular, there seems to be a lot of tennis lessons happening at the tennis courts, uh, like in, in some cases, three of the four courts and sometimes all four courts, uh, there are tennis lessons happening. And so uh, kids are waiting to play, we are waiting to play, adults are waiting to play, and uh, sometimes they stay on the court all day long with their lessons. Um, and uh, I've sent some emails to the parks department. Um, Sounds like it's tough to, to enforce uh, the permit process, but just wanted to bring it up and see if there's anything that can be done. I, I appreciate that. Um, Scott, do you want- uh, Todd, did you send an email to our office? Because I recall uh, receiving one. Yes, I did. I copied you on one of the, okay, I, co so I copied the office. I'm not sure who to. We have reached out to our uh, parks uh, supervisor over there at DOOR. Uh, I have not heard back from them. Uh, they were going to uh, talk with uh, the group that uh, handles the reservations and figure out how they might be able to uh, handle that. Uh, get, give me another day or so and I'll be able to uh, come back to you with some sort of response. Okay, great. So, Sundays in particular seem to be very challenging uh, over there. Uh, it used to be in the evenings, but now with the dark, it's not so much. Well, yeah, nobody, can, all nobody all can play in the dark. <laughs> I do appreciate you bringing that to our attention, though. That's uh, that's great because, uh, particularly during these difficult times here, uh, being able to get out with your family and yeah. uh, get some physical activity is is certainly so important, uh, yeah. both to the physical uh, aspect and then also your mental health as well. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I have no issue with the um, permitting process or the the rules seem to be fine. Um, it's really just figuring out how to enforce it. Right. There are, I mean, it is good to have lessons and, and there, I, I think they can have one or two courts going and that, that probably wouldn't be a problem, but when they take up all the courts, that's a problem. I appreciate Thank it. you. Okay, thank you. Any, anything else? This is, you know, I really enjoy this opportunity. So thank you for coming in for an hour of your morning. It's really nice to see your faces. It's nice to hear your questions. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just so hard to stay connected. I know we're tired of Zoom, I certainly am, but since this is the only way that I can see you right now safely, it really, it really warms my heart to be able to connect with you all. I cannot tell you how I will leave this meeting now and, and this will have made my day because I've been able to see you smile. I've been able to hear your questions. I've been able to have difficult questions and I understand that everybody's not happy and I'm, you know, I'm not all that happy either sometimes, but I, 
I just really value the, the exchange. As a council member, I ran to make our community better. And sometimes we're successful, sometimes we fail, but I don't know if I'm failing. I don't know if we're being successful if we don't have these meetings and I'm not getting the feedback from you. So I really, really appreciate that. Please be safe during Thanksgiving, please. Give all of your family members virtual hugs and let them know how much you love them, even though you cannot be there with them physically. That's really important to them. And it's important to us too. And please go with kindness and gratitude as you walk through this life in the next few months when life is really getting to be a struggle. With that, have a wonderful day and happy Thanksgiving. Please be at peace. Thank you.